Hi everyone, welcome to Friday Hacks 220. And we have two talks as usual today. So the first talk will be held by Chen Yuan, who will be speaking about geospatial analysis and visualization. And Chen Yuan graduated from NUS School of Computing in 2020 and has been working at Zeus Living as a software engineer for around two years. Uh, let's welcome him. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name, is, my name is Chen Yuan. Today, I'm here to present to you guys um, the company that I'm working at, it's called Zeus Living. This is, um, okay, so the agenda for today is that, firstly, I'll give a brief intro about myself. Um, next, about Zeus Living, which is the company I'm working for. And the main focus area for today is uh, this project that we have. It's called Demand Areas, which is a geospatial case study that we are using at our, that we are trying out at our company. Um, I'll go into some of the de like detailed uh, technical lessons about geospatial analytics. So specifically, there will be spatial operations, map, visual map visualizations, and spatial analytics. Uh, finally, before I end, I'll just give a very, very brief talk about our recruitment process right now before opening for Q&A. Hey, so about myself, my name is Chen Yuan. I graduated uh, from School of Computing in 2020. I was from Business Analytics, okay? but eventually when I started working at Zeus, I joined first as a full stack engineer. So even though I was from Business from BA, the a lot of times we, we develop apps as well. And through this process, I thought it's, some, it's a good place for me to try out app development, even though most of the time I'm doing like data analysis, um, building machine learning models for, for, the, for my own coursework, I wanted to try something new. So Zeus provided me with the opportunity. Yeah, and even though, and actually I started working at Zeus even before I graduated, because when I was in NUS, right, um, I think I overloaded quite a bit. Um, I took I took on some modules like orbital, which which means I'll be uh, clearing modules during the summer during the summer semester. And then uh, you know like some sometimes some of the modules some of the semesters are pretty chill. Then I'll take on some extra modules as well. So by the time I reach my year four sem two, I'm left with like one module, and I thought it would be a good time for me to just start working as well and some money, and which is why like in 2020 in my in my year for sem two, I'm working outside SR1 with my with some of my colleagues already. So they also started working before they graduated. Okay, so at first I joined as a full stack engineer, and then after that, um, along the way, I became a back end engineer, and now I'm more of a data scientist, which is why today I'm here sharing about the geospatial analytics that we are doing. Okay, so regarding this living, uh, what what is this company about? Okay, so we are a thirty we are a 30 day uh, furnished rental marketplace. So you can think of us like a bit like Airbnb, where if you want to, where you want to uh, go live somewhere and overseas, especially in the US, you can, you go Airbnb, you search for some houses that you want to stay with. Uh, Zeus Living is something like this as well. But different from Airbnb, right? We are actually a property management, uh, which we are kind of doing property management as well. So we reach out to landlords, we get the unfurnished house from them. And after you get unfurnished house from them, we have our own designers who go in to furnish the house. Um, we have a dedicated team of like ops people to bring in the furniture, um, interior, interior design, to make sure that the, the quality of houses that we have is consistent and basically good. So as, as you can see the picture over here on the, on the right side, this is one of the houses that we have. And it's quite typical of the houses that we have because uh, because of the interior designers that we have. Yep. So one of our main goals is that we, sorry, one of the main goals is that we want to allow our residents to live well, whenever opportunity, wherever opportunity takes them, and this really resonates with um, the current situation right now. Because ever since two years ago with COVID, people started working from home, and this really opened doors for people like um, people who want to travel around the world while working, and with Zeus, right. This is something that they can leverage on to find, to just work from anywhere around the world. So our company is based in San Francisco, uh, but we have a growing, a growing tech team in Singapore. So when we first started in 2020, it was like three or four of us working outside SR1. Um, it was quite fun. But ever since, like today, we have about like 12 people in a Singapore, in a Singapore office, and then we are still growing. 
we are mainly in we are mainly operating in the engineering um like most of our teams in singapore would be working on engineering teams um the product the product teams and the marketing teams all this they are they are mostly in the us yeah and one interesting thing is that we are funded by airbnb as well which is quite interesting because even though some people view them as a competitor to us um we view it as a strategic partnership because we believe that they are doing more of the short-term business and we are going into the long-term market area. Okay, so specifically, I would like to talk about the data products team at Zeus. Okay, actually, before I go there, right, I wanted to show you all about, show you all the website uh, so that you all can get a better idea of the uh, company. Yep, so this is our, this is our website. Uh, so once you come here, uh, let's, yeah, let's just say that you are someone who is going, wanting to go US to work for uh, work for a few months, maybe because you got an internship at Facebook, right? So you can just come here, um, and if you press the search button, it will take you to our main search page. So over here, you can see uh, all the houses that we have in, in San Francisco area. If I were to zoom into this area, um, like maybe in Mountain View. I think Facebook is at, is at Mendel Park, right? I don't really know which part is it. Yeah, but it's, it's somewhere around like the south of San Francisco. Yeah, but anyway, um, you, can, you can see what kind of houses you want. And then um, you can just uh, browse for more details. Okay, and one thing interesting I wanted to showcase is this uh, 3D tour that we have. So it's quite interesting. We, we had this like uh, since a few years ago already. And when I first joined the company, I was quite amazed that we have this, this feature. Lah. It's taking very long to load. Okay, but essentially, right, it's like, it's like Google Street View. And then uh, you, can really, you can go into the house and then see the 3D, uh, the 3D view of the entire house. And this just really gives you a lot of like, transparency as to what's going on. What are you buying into? Because you ultimately you'll be staying there for like two three months, and this is a very good uh, this is a very good feature for you to really explore the house without you flying there to to see what you're buying into. Okay, just wanted to show this quickly. Okay, and another feature um, that that I told you right is that uh, on the one on the one hand we deal with customers who want to rent our houses to to live in. Um, but on the other hand, we need to deal with property owners as well because we need to buy the house over first before we can uh, furnish it and make it available to our customers, right? So there's another flow here. So let's say if you are someone who owns a house and you want to do business with Zeus, you can click here, property owners. Yep. So uh, this is the flow where they can, where essentially, right, they can fill in their address here and after that, is, this will be sent to our, our own pricing team for them to evaluate um, how much this house is worth and we'll make them an offer. And ultimately, the value proposition for them is that they can just hand us over, they can just hand us a house and then um, we can make money for them. They, they just need to like sit back and relax. You don't have to worry about things like what happens if the pipe breaks, what happens if the lights spoil. Uh, all these things will be handled by us. We just need to provide the house and collect rent. Yeah, so this is just us selling them, saying that, oh, we have all these big tech firms. Uh, we have people from all these big tech firms staying here. So, um, yeah, so this is just to hype, hype things out a bit. Okay, uh, I just, I'm just going to go back to my slides now. Just wanted to share with you all uh, what the website is like. Yep, okay, so many of the things uh, happening in the website is actually powered by, powered by the data products team, which is the team that I'm working in. So we have this dynamic pricing engine, which kind of optimizes the prices that we have for every listing for the next few years. Um, we just want to make sure that we take into account things like seasonality, uh, the, probability of, the probability of being booked, and price everything such that we get the most, get the most, from, get the most possible. Lah. Okay, so uh, this, is, this involves some, some modeling around in the back end, um, and it's something that we have been using for quite a while now. Uh, the other, other projects we have is this thing called the search recommender. The search recommender is essentially something that uh, when you go to the search page, notice that when you map over an area, then there are many listings, right? And then 
the ordering of these things will be determined by the search recommender, which we built using some tree based models. Um, advanced booking model is essentially because for our houses, we have a minimum stay of 30 days. So let's say if let's say if this house is available starting from tomorrow, but instead you choose to book two weeks later, you are creating this two week awkward gap. And we are charging this, um, we, will, we have some model to charge this based on the probability of being booked to the next user so that we make sure we're not losing out. And finally, right, uh, one, of the one of the products that we are working on right now is this thing called the demand areas. And that will be what I'll be talking about today, demand areas. And this is, this is a geospatial case study that we have been, uh, we've, we've just been trying out. Like. Okay, so what this demand areas project is about is that firstly, as a startup, we want to expand, just like most startups, we want to expand quickly. We want to gain momentum in the market. We want to gain market share. But we want to make sure that we grow sustainably, right? We don't want to be in a case like Grab where they grow very, very quickly, but, come, but coming at the cost of huge losses. So uh, because we want to grow sustainably, uh, we need to have some uh, method to make sure that we are expanding in the right areas. And this really forms the motivation of this demand areas project. So the goal is that we want to identify specifically where there will be high demand from our, for our residents, uh, where in this case, more demand means higher profits. Um, and note that to simplify this project, we just, we just take note where have high demand. We don't really, we haven't really taken into to account supply constraints. Because in reality, right, you can't just look at demand. If, even if this place is very popular, but then on the market, there are not many houses for you to purchase, to, to, to rent it to customers. It's not really viable for us to enter there at all. But for the sake of, um, for the, sake of the MVP, we do not take into account supply for now. Yep, so I'm just gonna quickly show you uh, what uh, a prototype that we have done. It is, okay, yeah. It looks something like this. Okay, so this is Seattle area. This is Seattle area in, in the United States. And what we have done here, right, is that we look at various neighborhoods in the Seattle city. Um, and we use um, a form of model to predict how much demand we have in these areas. So generally speaking, we, uh, we have looked at some census data, like their medium income, their employment rate. And we also look at our competitors' um, metrics in these places. So uh, we, we look at our competitors like occupancy and their profit. And using all these factors, we just give a prediction of the, of the demand for each of these neighborhoods. So the idea is that um, once, once, this is, once, this is, um, that once this is improved, right? The idea is that um, the areas with blue, as you can see on the top right corner, right? The areas in blue are the places which, are, which has higher demand. The places in yellow have place, are places with lower demand. And um, basically, we want to tell our pricing team that these are the places which have a lot of demand. Go there to get new houses. You're likely to get more customers. So this is um, the project that we have been working on for the past several months. And going back to the slides. Yeah, and so this really forms the motivation of what I'm about to share today, um, which is how we, how we approach this problem and how we arrive where we are now. So this will be done through this section called geospatial learnings. Okay, so this section, right, was split into, was split into four, four parts. Um, the first two parts is kind of related. We'll do map, we'll, I'll go through how we do map visualization first, some of the spatial operations we have done, and data handling. Okay, and then after that, and then after that, um, the next section, the next two parts will be spatial analysis and spatial regression. So the hope is that um, after going through this, you would have a basic understanding of how, what geospatial analytics entails. And hopefully it will give you some confidence that you can, you can just begin developing yourself. 
Okay, so for the first part, I'll go over to the notebook I have here. Okay, so I'm not really sure how many of you are familiar with Python and whether you have used a notebook before. Okay, but um, even if you even if you're not familiar, uh, generally the code is quite easy to understand. So I'll just walk through step by step and hopefully you can follow. Can just stop me if, if you have any questions. But um, what this what this notebook is, right? Is so it's it's very it's really simple. This Google Collab, you can just if you have a Google account, you can create a Google Collab. It's a notebook that has a lot of functionalities in it. So one of the so some of the cool things is that um, when you run each each cell block, it will automatically generate the code below. So it's a very interactive environment. Okay, so what I've done here, right, is to just keep things simple. Uh, I just import some libraries, install some libraries first, then import them. Um, okay, and right off the bat, I want to show you this uh, library called Folium. Okay, so this library is this library is very powerful, uh, and it's very simple. It's very easy to use as well. So all you have to do, right, is that once you have this, um, once you import in Folium, you can just folium.map and you already have this interactive map that you can play around with already. Yeah, so you can just like zoom in and, and just see very detailed data. Okay. Then if you pass in some uh, information, so I, I went online and I went to find like, I just Google search NUS that long, which is, and I got this result. So if you just put in NUS that long in here, and you can specify a zoom, um, a zoom start, then it will just take you to where we are here. Yeah, this and USVD. That's it. Yeah, here. Okay, yeah, so this and USVD. Um, and what's even more cool is that you can set the tiles. So in, if you don't want this, I think this is by default, they use OpenStreetMap open tile, which is quite a lot of detailed information, quite cool. Uh, but if you want something that is more lightweight, you can just pass this in called PathoDB. And it's just a bit cleaner for you to look at um, the map at a very abstract view. Okay, this is, uh, over here I passed in Seattle that long really. So that's why we are in Seattle. Yeah, so, um, so with this library, right, we can easily visualize points on the map, but the issue now is that we have a map, we don't have the points. And that's what the next section is, uh, is about. I'm going to import in some of the data we have, and then we can show the points that appear on the map. Okay, so over here, um, I, just I just import some of our own uh, data in the, in the Seattle region. Okay, yeah, so this, is, this library is called Pandas. Um, again, I'm not really sure whether you guys are familiar with this, but Pandas is a library where you, where it helps um, engineers and data scientists to deal with data. Okay, so if you have a CSV file, you can load it into Pandas and then uh, you can do a lot of um, data manipulation and data processing with this library. So over here, right, you can see that I load in this CSV file and then I can just print out the table. So it has four columns. Um, for every row is one listing. It has the let long, it has the listing ID and bedrooms. Yep, and with this library, right, you can just do uh, a lot of like, a lot of stuff in a very simple way. You can just uh, find the summary statistics using this describe function. It shows you, it basically shows you the, um, the five, the five points in the, in the, across the distribution from mean 25% all the way to max. Okay, you can use this info function to tell you like which columns have missing data. Yeah, then after that, um, you can also do a lot of basic operations here. So um, over here, right, what I'm doing is a simple filter. So let's say, so let's say, right, I want to filter out all the listings which have two bedrooms. So I can just set this, uh, set this array. Basically, I, I look at the, uh, the column with bedrooms um, any bedroom that equal to two will be true. Uh, otherwise, it will be false. Then just pass this array into this uh, data frame, and then you can get the filtered version already. Okay, then there's also group by, uh, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. 
from, from the SQL lessons. So you can group by bedroom. And then uh, this is just the number of bedrooms, or rather the number of these things by bedroom gone. Okay, so that is pandas, um, very quick introduction. Um, now, if you want to in incorporate like geospatial parts, this is where geos geopandas come in. So geopandas, right, is basically built on top of pandas, but it has geospatial functionalities. So one of the key things is that they has this geometry column. Um, and over here, you just pass, you just tell, you just say that you want to use the long longitude column and the latitude column to build the geometry column. Okay, so as you can see here, right, uh, we have a new column called geometry. All these are point objects. And these point objects are important because like, um, when you want to perform a lot of geospatial operations, um, your pandas will recognize this column and do the operations accordingly. Okay, so oh, one more thing I want to point out is that this CRS, which stands for Coordinate Reference System. Okay, so when you have all this uh, let long data, they are essentially like just floats, right? But the float itself, the float themselves don't make sense because ultimately we need to map this float into, into a place in the real world. So this CRS that you see here is essentially a mapping from the, the it's like a unit, a mapping that you can tell, you can tell the, you can tell this system where when I say let one, it, it equates to which part on the, on the map. Okay, so normally for let long data, we have this CRS 4326. And yep, so after that, um, so as I mentioned, right, uh, all this thing uh, you have, once you have all the long data, you can plot it on the map. Okay. You can, uh, over here, I plot everything out on the, on the graph because like right now, right now we can't really see anything yet because there's no uh, base map layer. You can add a base map layer. Then uh, by doing so, we can add more context to these points. Okay, but instead we can just, uh, instead of adding a base map, right? Um, we can just use back what we learned uh, just now, which is volume. Volume is the interactive map. Remember? So um, what I've done here is that I use back the volume map above, and then I add another layer of this data point. So now all the data points that we saw just now, they are all here already. And because there's a base map now, there's, a, there's context as to what's happening. And I've also added in like the two tape over here. So for each point, you can see like how many bedrooms is that. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for the for this demo. But actually, there are a lot other there are a lot other like functionalities for Joe Pandas that I haven't shown here. Uh, one of it is called spatial join. So you know, like in the in databases, right? There's a join where you want to join two tables, you join on a column. So they will see maybe if you if these two columns, these two tables, um, you look at two columns. If they are equal, then they will join. Over here, right? It's the same idea, but they look at the geometry. So if this point um, overlap with another table of polygons, if so if this point fall into that polygon, it will join together. Yeah. So it's it's really cool. Um, all these the technology behind it, I'm not really familiar with it also. But uh, I think what's cool is that there's all this abstraction going on. So you don't really have to understand, but you can still use it to apply it to your own projects. Yeah, okay, so that's mainly map visualization and spatial operations and data handling. Um, okay, I'll just go to the spatial analy analytics part now. Okay, so for, for spatial analytics, okay, so anyway, uh, just to reiterate, so I was using Folium, uh, which is, uh, you can just Google this library online. It's like open source, free to use. So it's, um, it's very easy to get started. Then Joe Pandas is the, is the other one that I mentioned just now. Okay, then for spatial analytics, right? We use this other uh, package called PySol, which stands for Python for spatial analytics library, something like that. Okay, so um, whatever I'm about to show, right? I just uh, I just want to make an acknowledgement first. Um, I got a lot of my content from this website called geographicdata.sciencebook. Um, it's really 
it's really informative. So if you want to find out more, you can read this website. But otherwise, most of my information that I'm about to share with you uh, was gotten through here. Okay, so when we talk about uh, when we talk about like spatial analytics, one of the first thing, right, um, is that when you look at the map, is there any information in the spatial information? Or rather, is that sorry, is there any information in the spatial ordering of things? And I mean, like, if you look at um, if you look at a, a map of listings, maybe some of them are clustered according to some pattern. Okay. But if you just look at the if you just look at the map, right? You sometimes you, it's not obvious to you like whether is there a pattern or not. So the point of spatial autocorrelation is that, or rather, the idea of behind spatial autocorrelation is that we can do some form of like tests to ascertain whether there is any form of relationship in the encoded in the geospatial information. Okay, so uh, just to give you an example, right? Uh, what I've what I've pasted here on the right side. This is um, the EU referendum data from 2016. Um, this are color coded according to the percentage of people who voted to leave, the, who voted for UK to leave the EU. So um, if it's like the more purple it is, the less percentage of people in that region wants to leave. Um, the more yellow it is, uh, means that there's a higher proportion of people who want to leave the area, who want, who want to leave the EU. Okay, so if you just look at this yourself, right? Um, can you all tell like whether there's a spatial pattern? Um, it's there seems to be right. Like if you look at the the north part, it's like a lot of purple. Then if you look at the bottom part, there's more yellow and green. So generally, it seems like in the north part, um, in the Scotland area, right? People don't really want to leave the EU. Then in the south south eastern part. People generally want to leave. Okay, so this is just based on my intuition, um, but we don't really know for sure. Okay, so right, um, which brings me to this point, lah. So the power, the purpose of spatial autocorrelation is that we want to use statistics to kind of give an estimate on how how true this intuition is. Okay, so. To understand spatial autocorrelation, we can. I, I need to introduce this term called the spatial lag first. So, what the spatial lag is about, right, is that if you look at, we, we want to look at the metric, not just for each of this polygon here. I think each polygon here should be like a city or something. Or something. So, um, instead of just looking at the city itself, right, I want to look at the neighbors of the city. So, if you look at this equation, this YSL, SL for spatial lag. Um, for each of the city, I will look at its neighbors and I will multiply a weight of it by it. So ultimately, this, uh, this thing you see here is that for every, for every city, we look at how much. Sorry, let me close this. Yeah, so for every, for every city, right, we see. Um, we see what the neighbor's value is. Okay. Yeah, okay, so this already after. Okay, so after we after we do this, right? So over here, I picked out like two specific cities. Um, the first column you see here is um it refers to that city. How many people, what is the percentage of people who want to leave? The second column, right, is the leaf lag, which means the neighbors of that city, how many, uh, on average, right, how many percent of people want to leave? Okay, so the, the first row, it refers to Liverpool, uh, which is like this city down here. Okay, it's a bit small, we can, I hope we can see it. Wait, sorry. It's a bit small, but you'll notice that it is like blue color, but it's surrounded by all the green color parts. So what this means is that, um, even though by itself, right, Liverpool people, um, they, they don't really want to leave because like only 41% say they want to leave, right? But the neighbors around them generally say they want to leave. Okay, so uh, it's like 54%. Compared to another city, um, this, this other city is in, in the northern part of UK. 
this other city, right? It has a very similar, it has quite a similar percentage of people who want to leave. And the neighbors also have the same value. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you, if you, even though they look similar, these two places look similar, but their neighbors of these two places are actually drastic, drastically different between these two. And because like for this voting, most of the time it's like 50% is the threshold. It, once, you, once you cross 50, then it is considered um, the hope is considered that this city want to leave really. Okay. So um, what this slide is about is supposed to show you is that once you calculate spatial lag, you can understand what's happening around your neighborhood. So not just the city itself, but you understand the, the city surrounding you. Yep. So um, these two diagrams I have here on the left side, right, is the is the normal graph. So every polygon that you see is percentage of people who want to leave uh, from the city. And then the one on the right is the spatial lag. So each, each polygon you see, right, it shows the percentage of people who want to leave in the neighboring parts of that, of that city. Yeah, right. So um, generally, once you do this, it helps move out the differences. Okay, but uh, why did I introduce spatial lag? So we know that spatial lag means you look at the neighbors, right? And the, the, normal, the normal statistic is you look at the, the polygon itself. And spatial lag is you look at the neighbors as well. So it turns out that what we can do, right, um, to measure whether there's spatial autocorrelation is using this statistic called Moran's eye. Okay? Um, to understand it, I'm going to show you this Moran's plot first. So what this Moran's plot is doing is that um, for, each of the, for each of the city, you subtract from the mean. So this is the standardized percentage on the leaf. Okay, so on the horizontal axis, it say it shows the percentage of people who want to leave for each city. On the vertical axis, it shows the percentage of people who want to leave in the neighboring cities. And you can see that there's a generally a positive correlation, right? This red line is the best red line. Um, what the way to interpret this, right, is that when when my city of people they want to they want to leave. Um, my neighbors also want to leave, and vice versa. If if um, if my city don't really want to leave the EU, then my neighbors also tend to want to leave the EU. Like of course we got outliers in these two quadrants, um, but generally you can see that there is this association. There's this um, association depending on where you are on the map. Okay, so using this information, right? You can run this um, this test, um, this statistic test, this statistical test. Um, it's kind of similar to how you do all the t tests that you learn in statistics. Um, it's quite it's quite similar, but then it's what they do is they do uh, what they do right is that they run um, some simulations, so they will randomly shuffle all these. So imagine this is the true data right on the left side. Uh, what they do, right, is that they randomly shuffle the data around the different uh, parts of the, of the country. They calculate the statistic and they repeat it for like thousands of times. And af after they repeat thousands of times, right, they can see each time they do it, they can calculate what the statistic is. Okay? And this is the result on the left-hand side. So generally, right, um, most of the time the statistic should fall inside this range. But for our particular case, for this data set, the statistic, the statistic calculated is all the way here on the right-hand side. So, um, like you know, normally when it's like less than 5%, you can reject the null hypothesis and not. Over here, the, the null hypothesis is that there is spatial randomness, which means that um, things are distributed regardless of where they are. So uh, spatial information is irrelevant. Okay? But then the fact that um, it is very far to the right would, would tell you that um, you can reject the null hypothesis uh, and therefore conclude that there is, there is no spatial randomness, uh, which means we can apply some sort of like spatial um, techniques to account for this effect. Yeah, so um, this is one of the, I think this is like one of the main tests that, um, that we do to, to just test whether there's like spatial information encoded in the, in the data set. And once you know that there is, so once this test 
uh, reject null, null hypothesis, right? Then you can proceed on to apply some sort of like spatial regression methods to account for this spatial information. Yep, okay. So previously I was telling you about like for spatial lag, right? I was telling you about how we can look at the neighbors and then apply the weights, the weights to, to, to it, right? So it turns out that when we look at neighbors, um, there are many ways for us to look at neighbors. Um, there's traditionally there's this rook and queen method. So imagine you have this like three by three grid over here. And the rook method is you only look at the the cells which are adjacent to you horizontally or vertically. Then for the queen method, you'll look at the diagonal axis as well. Hey, okay, but in the real world, um, when we look when, when we look talk about like points on the map, it's a bit hard to it's a, it's a bit hard to use this method. Uh. So instead, the more the more um, at least for our use case, um, the one that we use will be the nearest neighbor because um, it has many benefits. Uh, firstly, like for the root and queen method, right? You have to it 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 depends on density. So if you are if you are in a very dense area, then you can easily find like nine neighbors beside you. If you are not in a dense area, maybe you only find like um, a few points beside you. So you can't really use this method. But for nearest neighbor, it doesn't really matter how dense or how dense an area is. It will just find the nearest neighbors and use their weights to come to determine how important they are to you. Yeah, so um, there's so like various kinds of kernel weight functions. Essentially, what it is doing is that um, if you if you think into account of neighbors, right? Okay, for example, this one. Um, generally, you want to give some you want to give a bit more weight to people who are closer to you versus points which are like very far away from you. Uh, this is just based on um, a, a theory that some some guy mentioned. Uh, it just says that points which are closer to you will have more effect on you than points that are further away from you. So because of that, generally people apply this uh, kernel function, uh, which just decays with distance. So um, as you can see here, right, with increasing distance, the effect of the point would decrease over time. And this just varies by slope, depending on which function you use. Yeah, so this is just a, yeah, so generally this uh, is what I am covering for spatial analytics. We look, we first look at spatial autocorrelation to determine whether there's spatial dependence. If there is, then we can apply some methods like spatial regression to take into account this effect in our models. And with that, I, um, this we come to the last part over here, which is how we want to factor in like spatial information into our model. There are, there are actually many methods, uh, but I'm just going to highlight one here, uh, which I think would be, which at least for the project that we are working so far, this is the most relevant one. So there's this model called the, the exogenous effect model, uh, and which is SRX model. Uh, SRX because spatial, spatially lack um, exogenous model, I think. Okay, so uh, over here, right, um, this is another data set already. But what it's trying to what it's trying to do is that it's trying to predict the price of a uh, of Airbnb listings in I think in Berlin. Okay, so on the left hand side here, uh, P is the price of a listing. Okay, so this is like a typical regression uh, P is the price of a listing, and then after that, um, X I will be things like number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, square feet. Okay, uh, beta is the weight for each of these factors. Okay, so so far this is like normal regression. Uh, the normal like least square regression. Okay, but for, for this SLX model, it has one additional part over here. Okay, so what, what is happening here is that yeah, I'm looking at the neighbors of this listing. So imagine um, this listing is a one bedroom, but if the neighbors around me is all like, is all two bedrooms, then that will be taken into account over here. It will sum across all the neighbors. And it will be weighted according to like how far away they are from, from this particular listing. Okay, and this will be done for all the relevant um, attributes you have. So 
this means that we take into account our neighbor's bedroom, bathroom, square feet also. Okay, so in total, this whole model is like the least square regressions plus um, effects of the neighbors altogether. Yeah, and then this is just a interpretation of this is just an analysis of the of the results that they uh, that was given in the website. So um, what what they did right is that they want to predict the price of a, of a house in Berlin using um, these like categorical variables. So this just means like what type of house it is. So uh, the way to interpret this is that this 0 0.1 over here, right? It just means that if your house is a condominium, then um, it will be, it will, be, it will contribute 0 0.1 to the lot price, which actually means that it will, once you are a condominium, your price will be more expensive than the baseline by about 11%. So in this case, the baseline is apartments. Okay, so um, your, if you all recall in your stats class, there's this thing called the dummy variables, right? So if, you, if your column is a categorical uh, column, then you will convert it into dummy variables, where if you are a condominium, you'll be one, uh, if not, it'll be zero. And then if you're if you not condominium, you're not house, you're not other, you're not townhouse, then you'll be the apartment. Okay, so in this case, the, the base is the apartment. So once, um, how to interpret this is that if it's a condominium, it'll be 11% more expensive than the base, which is uh, apartment and so on. And this four other parts here, it is the part where we look at our neighbors. So over here, right, the way to interpret this is that if um, in my neighborhood, if in my neighborhood, the number of condominiums increase by zero by zero point one. Okay, so if the number of condominiums around me increase by ten percent, my price would um, my price would be affected by five point nine percent. Okay, that's how we interpret this. So it's not necessarily um, the causation is not necessarily like this, but the way to interpret it uh, will be as such. So it could be basically the, the underlying reason could be the fact that this area is more expensive. That's why there are more condominiums over here. And um, that's why your house is more expensive. So that could be the underlying reason. But let's, let's just say that right now, uh, a property agent comes, right? And they want to give a valuation for this house. They can use this model to help them do the prediction. They can see that, oh, this house is a condominium. So it's 10% more expensive than the apartments around here. And because the surrounding is also condominiums, I can use this um, to further um, adjust my predicted price. Yeah, so um, generally this is, this is one of the models that you can use. And it is something that, um, that we are potentially going to use as well as Zeus, because uh, if you see, right, essentially we want to predict demand. So we look at the factors, maybe look at the income of this place, the number of competitors in this place. Then we factor in the neighboring cells, the, the neighboring like neighborhoods around us. And using all this information, we can give a prediction on how good the demand is for this area. Yeah, so ultimately we end up something like this, right? Like if you want to see here, you look at the you look at the income in this place, look at the competitors in this place, you look at the neighbors, and using all this information, you just give a prediction on how well this place will do. Yeah, so the hope is that, uh, I mean, this is just a, our first prototype, so it's nowhere near accurate. But then along the way, we can make more predictions, uh, we can uh, get more features, get more data. Uh, getting competitive data is one of the more tricky parts. So we're trying to get all this data in and hopefully build a more accurate model. Yeah, so um, actually that's pretty much it really. So what I went through, right, is uh, I showed your, wait, let me just go back to the, the summary stack. Okay, so, so what I did, right, is that uh, I showed you all the map visualization, right, which can be done using Folium. Then after that, uh, talk a bit about, about pandas and geopandas, how we can use to perform all the spatial operations, all the data handling. Um, after that, uh, once we have all this like base uh, foundation already, we move on to the more like advanced part of 
spatial, spatial analysis. Uh, we talk about spatial autocorrelations, um, how we can weight our neighbors differently using spatial weights. And finally, using all this information, we use spatial regression to perform, um, to perform some sort of prediction to our, to our map data. And yeah, that will be pretty much it already for the, for the presentation. The last slide I have here is um, hiring related. Um, I think before, before I go here, uh, I can just open the floor to questions if you have. I'll be happy to answer them. Yep, if if don't have, then I can just go to the last slide. Can I ask questions from online? Yeah, sure. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, one is about uh, Z coordinate. Like consider you have one condo and then you have a like, apartment on the first floor and the last floor, mm -hmm. right? So, like, how much sense would it be to like just combine them uh, uh, according to like simple regression model? Because, like, if you think about the floor, it may be correlated to the price because, like, nobody wants to go all the way up to like 30 floor in condo. Right. So, yeah, talking so, about like, uh, is, is there yeah. a good, is, is there a, uh, a possibility to include the uh, extra dimension to this analysis, like be it uh, z coordinate or be it some other parameter. Right. So just to clarify, uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, just to clarify, you're saying um, adding the floor of the of the unit to the model as well, is it? For example, uh, so like. In a way, you're already doing it by uh, grouping data by a type of housing, like a condo, like normal housing or some private housing. But uh, like if it, we can think about other axes, like, must it be done by grouping as well? Or is there some uh, general model to take into account such things? Right, so um, what, what I'm hearing is that uh, we want to basically do more feature engineering to get the right, uh, to get more robust data into the model? Uh, yeah, I, I'm mostly asking from the point of view, from, uh, from the regression, not necessarily your particular application, but uh, in general, is there a mathematical theory behind uh, taking into account more than just 2D? Um, not really, can you repeat the last, the, the question again? So in, uh, in general, I'm asking uh, whether there is some mathematical theories to include more than just 2D data, not just distances, but also some other parameters. Oh, so, okay. Uh, so, so instead of just looking at the neighbors, which are 2D, like based on distance, uh, do we have, do we look at the floors, for instance, like the, the altitude? Yes. Uh, I see, I see. Yes. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think that's something that we I haven't considered before yet. Um, if we have data in, in there as well, um, I mean I think it's possible to uh, use this approach to uh, edit in as well. So uh, maybe like over here, um, as you mentioned, right? This is on the two mm D -hmm. on the two D plane based on the distance based on the horizontal distance across the earth, right? Um, and maybe you can have like yes. one more segment where we take into account the height. So um, uh, I think- uh, or Generally, it's just some, some other parameter. It's not, not necessarily going to be height, right? And like, in a way you can think of a type of the housing as an extra axis, for example. So. I, I I guess so, so. There is no in play theory. You you need to extend the existing one. Am I correct? There is um. Okay, sorry. Can you repeat the last one again? I I didn't quite get it. There is no available theoretical model to extend to more axis. 
So you have to extend this this model to to take right. into account more. Right, right. Okay, um, I see. Okay. Based on, yeah, but based on my research, I I haven't come across uh, that model that you mentioned, where we think into account um, like a third dimension um, of data. So um, hmm. like whatever I mentioned to you, adding on a new set of um, like variables here, that is just based on my that's just based on me thinking thinking about it right now. Um, yeah, personally, I I don't know. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, the second part is somewhat related. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, like if you now you're looking at just uh, root like crude distance, and now I imagine a map and there's a river, right? On the left the bank of the river, there's some poor district, and the right bank of the river, there's some rich districts. Like, uh, how how does this model perform in such circumstances? Or like as you. Taking your example of uh, English voting, like what will happen in the border regions between uh, Irish and uh, British regions? Mm -hmm. So you, you can think like on like they are geographically very close, but there is like some physical or some uh, principal uh, difference between uh, nearby regions. Right, so um, taking into account the the income levels as well, would, would that be? Oh, not income levels, but I guess there is some principal difference between people in this case, right? Or like in in your uh, company approach, uh, my example is river, right? So like you have two buildings on two sides of the river, they are technically very close, but uh, yeah, actually. In Actually, practice, my colleague, my colleague has some ideas. Uh, maybe you can answer it. Mm. Yeah, th thanks for these questions, by the way. They're very statistically insightful. I, I actually want to go back to your first question, right? Um, answer that, and then I think I can continue on with the second one. So, with regards to your first question, um, to, to answer your point, right, whether or not you know we can integrate the flaws in as like a, a, a third dimension beyond the x and y, like latitude, longitude axis, the answer is yes. Right, the SLX model is basically an extension of like the ordinary least squares, and the OLS model itself, right, doesn't really care for the precise like number of dimensions you have. You can extend it to any arbitrary dimension. Now, whether or not flaws are best represented using like a z-axis, now that is a separate question altogether, right? And like to your point, um. In, in our specific research, I think, in, in, in this field of literature, um, flaws tend to be represented just simply, you know, as another like separate um, scalar value, right? And not necessarily in terms of mm. like, a, a spatial height. That doesn't really give any distinct gains um, in predictive capability. Yeah, of course. Now, for this specific question on, you know, what happens if we have, let's say, a river or some other geographical feature that are separating, you know, places which are pretty close, right? And so, therefore, there's actually more distance in that sense than meets the eye, right? For, for, for a river, for instance, even though they might just be 100 meters apart, just across the water, right? It, it tends to represent a, say, a, a greater intuitive distance. I think there are many ways to kind of like fix um, this problem, right? One way is in the, um, let's move over to the slide. One way is, is in the way in which we determine, right? How like distance actually translates like over to weights. Right, so um, for example, if, if let's say you've ever done any algorithms on shortest path, right, what we can do is once mm -hmm. we take into account the spatial distance, right, we could weight it by the amount of so-called like geographical difficulty, right, in a sense. So if we draw a straight line and we determine that it's mostly over mountains or rivers, we could easily multiply out the weight constant by let's say 100. So these are like arbitrary approaches. I would say that in our specific research, we have not yet encountered these problems substantively to be able to solve it, but that would just be like my first intuition, right? To treat it the same way okay. that any other I computer see. scientist would treat, like let's say uh, a shortest path problem. Yep. Thank well, you. Uh, that it is a shortest path problem uh, for like arbitrary graph, maybe not so straightforward. Uh, like, yes. Can you even find a service to, to get that kind of data quickly? Uh, but of course, if it doesn't match up for your particular application, you don't care. Yes. Yeah. You don't yeah, need that, to solve the problem. 
that, that is exactly yeah. right. That is exactly right. So just imagine you're just like weighting the edges based on like whatever geographical feature we want to care about. But it all depends on this particular domain. And right now, like just from my experience, not very sure. We haven't encountered this problem specifically. Yep. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you. All right. Um, if, yeah, if there are no other questions, I'll just uh, finish up the last slide that we have um, that is regarding hiring. So um, just wanted to just wanted to give a, a very like small advertisement that this is hiring right now. Uh, the Singapore office is hiring. We are actually looking uh, more like right now. We are still looking uh, for more senior roles, but we do have junior roles opening up in two, three, three, four. Which if you guys like year four now, um, it means that by the time you graduate, um, this could be an opportunity for you, right? So you can visit us on our website uh, over here at jobs jobslever.co.zeus uh, slash zeus or you can just simply scan this QR code over here uh, which will bring you to the jobs page as well and all these um, if you have any questions um, like if you are not sure whether to apply yet uh, just want to find out more you can feel free to reach out at us um, at this email at this telegram handle uh, all of these queries will be directed to Jiaxing which is who is the person who just spoke um, his He's working with me um, and he's basically my boss. So you can reach out to him. He'll, he's very friendly. He'll let you know, uh, if, he'll let you know your answers, uh, hopefully. Right in. Thank you. Thank you, Changin, for the very insightful talk. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bastian Gary. I'm a free software activist and developer, and I'm the maintainer of. Uh, Emacs org mod uh, that I will present to you. And let me share my screen for the presentation that is uh, <clears throat> a presentation in Emacs. So uh, can you see my screen correctly? And just interrupt me if not. And also feel free to ask questions at any time. So what is uh, org mod? Uh, org mod is basically two things that we shall not confuse. The first one is a plain text format similar to Markdown, meaning that uh, you have .org files that are plain text files where you can write, uh, store information, and handle this uh, information the way you want, uh, benefiting from everything that is known, uh, that you can benefit from when using plain, plain text files. And org mode is also a GNU Emacs mode to interact with this format. Uh, that is to uh, make the most of your org file. So what you see on the screen right now is exactly this. It's an org file and I manipulate it with uh, Emacs. So the white background is my Emacs background here. Uh, it's important to insist on the two things because you can see org mode files and formats being handled by other tools than uh, GNU Emacs. Uh, Vim, there is a Vim organizer plugin. You have VS Code uh, dealing with org files. So org mode is the is the, the the GNU Emacs tools, and org is the format uh, the files the format of the files for this. Org mode was, uh, let me show you the website. It was uh, started in 2003. So uh, it's um, a bit less than two decades ago. It's quite uh, long for a free software. And it was started by uh, Carsten Dominic, who did all the groundwork uh, in the first few years. And then I, <clears throat> I proposed to be a maintainer uh, for the last 10 years and there are Today, there are many contributors and many other core maintainers, and I will describe this uh, a bit more. The main idea, uh, the main intuition that Carsten had 20 years ago was that the process of defining to-do items emerges, emerges from taking notes. Uh, at the time, you had many, uh, the same than today, you had many uh, to-do uh, task managers and you had many note-taking applications. And the core idea was uh, to merge the two needs 
and have something that helps you take notes and define to-do items and organize your to-do items along with your note-taking process. It presents itself as a structured plain text editing tool. So you have section. So this is a headline that I'm currently in. You have text formatting, for example, for bold um, uh, words, uh, emphasize, um, underline, for example, and uh, what you would expect for uh, any from any text formatting and note taking tools. You have lists. Let me quickly show how, what you can do with the list. You can reorganize them. You can uh, demote uh, list item. Uh, have uh, another one. You can say that this should be a checklist. Uh, you can change the status of the checklist. Uh, you can add it manually or have it uh, added by, you know, shortcuts. We like shortcuts because we love shortcuts. You, we also have tables. Uh, editing tables in plain text files is always uh, difficult. And here um, it's uh, really easy. Um, you can insert lines in your table uh, and so and so on. You can have multiple column, columns. Here you add the columns, here you add more columns, you delete the columns, you move, you create rows, uh, you move the rows up and down, you move the columns uh, on different uh, sides and so on. So that's really very nice tool to uh, deal with uh, uh, tables. What about uh, exporting? Because of course, maybe you want this document to be exported in, in uh, <clears throat> various formats. So for example, here, I process my Emacs buffer and I have this new uh, uh, PDF file that is here. So here you see the PDF that is generated from uh, LaTeX that is generated from the buffer. So you have the list, you even have here the checklist and uh, other tools. It's a to-do list manager, uh, meaning that, for example, here, this section, for now, it's just something that uh, I use for note-taking, but I can say, okay, I started this task. Or I can say, well, this task has a tag that is right. You have a tag about mail. Uh, you can switch the to-do status very easily uh, from one keystroke to another. Uh, and you can plan this thing to say, okay, I need to do it today, so or maybe tomorrow. And then here, the, the, now the task is scheduled. And that's uh, really important. You have priorities. You can switch from prior, one priority to another one, and you can add uh, a category. So, for example, here I just add the demo category for this tool. What's important is that uh, with this tool, you can uh, create an uh, agenda view. So, for example, I know that I have this event for today. Let's say it's for today. Um, and I want to um, see what I need to do for today. And then I create this agenda view. And it shows the, the to-do item. I can say I want the weekly view, and then I have all the uh, to-do items for this week. Agenda views are really powerful, so I'm just showing uh, something very superficial here, but that's uh, just to give you a gist of what's possible. Tables are nice, but you may want to have spreadsheet uh, capabilities within Emacs. So for example, here, this is my first line. I do add some uh, basic uh, data. And then I say, hey, here I want the sum of uh, the, 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 these two first rows. Or here I want the mean of these two first rows. And this is just plain text. OK, so I have the uh, mean here. I have the sum here. And these definitions uh, operate on the table. So if I do remove uh, the, the output, then I just hit Control c Control c and this performs the calculations. The glitch you have here is because uh, the calculation is performed in two steps, uh, and you need to reperform it uh, to have this output here. That is the sum of 
uh, the means that you have in the rows. So that's good, and uh, many people uh, use uh, Augmod as a spreadsheet uh, system, and that's really powerful. Here, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of literate programming, that is, describe documents, embed some source code in your documents, and generate the programs based on this um, uh, encompassing and this global document. So you, you first write stuff, description, documentation, features, whatsoever, and then you include the source code within these documents. And you can then tangle the source code into a separate uh, source code file. Here I just, uh, it's not really literate programming by itself. It's just the ability to execute source code within my Emacs buffer. So this line says, okay, let's have a source code block using Emacs Lisp and let's uh, say um, hello, for example. So I changed the source code a bit and I hit the control C, control C, magic key, and I have the output of this here. Of course, you can uh, <clears throat> have many other um, functions and you have many other languages. Uh, so if you want to execute Python code, like in the Jupyter no notebooks, you can use your Emacs buffer for that. So here it is. This is uh, basically what I wanted to show you because the rest of org mode you can discover uh, by yourself reading the documentation. Now some words about this um, uh, this big project, this big free software project, and how do we operate as a community? Uh, we have some strong opinions, and I want to share them with you and to discuss them with you uh, afterwards. We use a mailing list. Uh, we are not on GitHub because we think GitHub is not uh, a fair platform for free software. Uh, GNU Emacs is part of the GNU project, and Augmod is part of GNU Emacs. So uh, Augmod is part of the GNU project, and we refuse to use um, GitHub as a platform when we are in the GNU project. So we use a mailing list like many other free software projects out there, uh, the most famous one being uh, Linux. Uh, it works. Um, we have more than 2,000 people, uh, subscribers on this mailing list that exchange with each other, write uh, messages to each other uh, to develop patches and commits and to continue to uh, make Augmod uh, an awesome tool. We don't have uh, uh, two mailing lists. We just have one. One that is for discussing the development of the software and we discuss it with all the users, at least those users who want to subscribe to the mailing list. But there was suggestions in the past to have two mailing lists, one for developers and one for users. And we resisted to that because we deeply think that the powerfulness of Augmod is that most users are uh, computer scientists and most users are potentially uh, contributors. So we want to encourage all the, 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 the subscribers on this list to contribute one day and to take this step of, you know, daring to submit a patch on the mailing list. We don't have a roadmap. Uh, all um, Augmod contributors are uh, volunteers, so we operate on a best effort basis. So this is not to say that any uh, free software project out there should not have a roadmap. Of course, uh, if free software is backed by a company or by a very structured community with people getting paid for, for developing the software, you can have uh, a roadmap. But for us right now, we don't have a roadmap. And we like to move slow and not breaking things uh, as is done in Emacs. Emacs is uh, uh, 40 years old now, I believe. And it moves slow, it progresses, it's still great, it attr attracts many users, and we follow the same spirit of moving slow and not breaking things. One failure I want to share with you is that <clears throat> when Carsten Dominic was invited um, to speak about Augmod in, in, in Google, that was more than 14 years ago, I believe, um, insisted on the fact that 99% of the features were developed organically. Like this was all feature requests. So the seed, the very minimal org uh, design was already here 
in the first year and everything that came afterwards was really added by uh, new ideas, new contributions. For example, all the code execution capabilities have been added by uh, 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 someone after Augment existed. And what it means, it means that you, you need to have a great seminal ID to be able to uh, cope with this organic development. But it also means that when someone comes and has uh, a very uh, a, a proposal that requires us to change the design principles or to change some uh, something deep in the structure of the code, that's really hard. And uh, we, I think we had several contributors, uh, designers saying, oh, Augment is great, but there are some difficulties for beginners and I want to help you um, overcome the difficulties by, you know, changing a few, a few things. So that's okay, but that's really difficult as a maintainer and as a community to integrate those change because this requires an upstream uh, a, a discussion, upfront thinking. So if you develop free software, you have to think of how do you integrate designers in the, in the process of developing it. So, and, and I encourage you to think this ahead very much because uh, that's something that will pay off uh, afterwards. So here I just want to give you some hints on what I think are the ingredients for a successful free software. Uh, the first one being that you need to uh, uh, stand on the, shoulder, the shoulders of giants, meaning that you need to have your, uh, uh, your free software project being part of a very active uh, ecosystem. Augmod is part of Emacs, and that's because of the power of Emacs that we have 90% uh, uh, of the power of, um, of, of Augmod. So really it's important to think uh, where, what is your platform uh, for, for making your, your software a success. Sometimes it's the language itself. Sometimes it's the, the ecosystem of libraries. Sometimes it's a framework uh, whatsoever, but you have to think this um, uh, upfront. The next key factor is, are your users potential developers and potential developers and contributors? Um, that's very important. If you develop a free software uh, for education, for example, most of your users will be uh, children at school. Uh, if they don't know how to code, they will, and, and don't know how to report a bug, for example, then it's will, it will be really difficult to have them contribute and we have this chance in Okmo to have a, a, an audience of developers and, and most developers from using Okmo are, are really uh, into Emacs and, and really eager to make this uh, platform uh, the greatest platform. So that's a, the second question that you would have to ask yourself. Have a great documentation. We cannot insist on that uh, enough. Um, and having a great documentation means that it's synced uh, with uh, the features of the software and uh, that you have a nice guide for contributors. Don't break things. I told you we are really into this move slow and don't break things um, uh, idea. And I even wrote uh, partly as a joke, but partly seriously, the what I call the software maintainers pledge. And I encourage you to just read it because it's just uh, one page. Uh, I won't break your user experience. Um, we did some mistakes in the past when developing Augma, then sometimes we just broke uh, the, 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 the user experience and it's always wrong. So you don't have to remove features. You don't have to uh, 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 pretend to upgrade things by removing features. You don't have to break configurations because users are really in love with their own configurations, especially in max configuration. So don't break this, don't break the muscle memory. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's basically it. Don't break the user experience, uh, rely on it. Th think of it as your main uh, trust capital that you need to nurture 
to be nice with and to continue to grow, uh, to use as, the, as a platform to grow. Uh, especially uh, this one, <laughs> I won't break your user experience. And if I do break your user experience, I won't give lame excuses. For example, using semantic versioning uh, is often used as an excuse to break stuff. Uh, we think uh, that I do things. I do think that's that's wrong. And sometimes even software correctness is not an excuse to uh, break the user experience. If your software is the most correct one and, 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 and users leave, then you're alone with something that is very correct, but uh, very useless. Anyway, um, the last key factor is to be, to have a community that is inclusive and grateful. Take a habit of saying hi and thanks. Um, that's the habit I tried to have for the last uh, uh, decade. And we can see some platforms like GitHub not really encouraging this because it's easy to just send a bug report by, you know, saying, hey, this doesn't work and, and, and not being nice. So code, contrib code contributors are one thing. Uh, you can use them. But mostly it's the role model that you can play as a maintainer that is really important. Credit contributors correctly, of course, and enroll new maintainers very early, not just contributors. This is something you have to think about. How do you uh, enroll uh, maintainers? People that will be uh, with the project after you, you stop. So this is now the renty part. Um, all bug trackers suck. Um, there are too many different interfaces. Think of the status uh, the, 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 that we were uh, living in before Git. So Git saved us from uh, the DVCS chaos. Uh, I wish there was a tool to save us from the bug trackers uh, chaos. Most are web-based. It's not really the best uh, interacting platform uh, for this particular use of, you know, bugs from uh, free software project. Of course, I know uh, everyone is using GitHub issues, but I think even GitHub issues has uh, issues. What about data portability? Of course, there is an API to uh, get your data back from GitHub issues. Of course, there are APIs here and there, but what is the standard format for uh, data from, uh, from, from bugs? Because most bug reports are very informal. Even if you have guidelines uh, in, in, in GitHub, for example, then it's really difficult to discipline the users to make very good, well-structured uh, bug trackers. And sometimes for, for good reasons, because you don't want your uh, contributors to be fluent in English, for example, not all clever people speak English. Um, so that that's an issue. And <clears throat> I'm a big fan of Merlin Mann and the Inbox Zero methodology for emails. Uh, what is Inbox Zero for uh, bug trackers? So Merlin Mann says, don't use your email inbox uh, as your to-do list. And that, that's a very uh, life-changing advice that you can tell to someone. Uh, if you use your, he, he explains how it, your, your life can turn into a chaos. If you use your inbox as your to-do list, you have to have a separate tool for, for the to-do list. But what happens is that most bug trackers are used as this, you know, inbox, infinite, uh, completely open inbox for everything, not just well-structured uh, bug reports, but feature requests, uh, complaints, and, and, and even spam sometimes. So what happens is that they having a bug trackers uh, require a, a, a bug triage and that's new energy that you need to put in your project. So for uh, most of the time, Ogmod had no bug tracker and we were happy like that. But uh, uh, recently uh, that, that was breaking the Joel Spolsky rules on having a good software project, but we were happy with it because all the interactions on the mailing list 
were useful to fix bugs and we were quick in fixing them. The community, the commentators were very quick and there was no complaint of not having a bug tracker. Um, so I give you here a, a list of examples and I think the best bug tracker uh, here is um, the one from Source Hut. I don't know if you know this project, and I certainly recommend you to see Source Hut. That is a free software forge uh, that is fair to users and that uh, operates mainly free software projects, and that is uh, really email based for any any interaction of the project. And they have a nice um, bug tracker that you can open bugs by email and 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 track things you can um, you have data portability but uh, I still think there is some room for improvement so what happens is that recently we started to have uh, this page uh, where we are tracking a various thing so we are tracking upcoming changes because what users most users need is okay what is going to change what is going to break so we have really just a few things. Uh, for example, here we say that there will be no release on, of org on this uh, packaging system org uh, Elpa that was really ad hoc, ad hoc and that we needed to shut down. Uh, we are switching to new Git repositories and that is also a very big announcement. So upcoming change. Then help requests, that is users helping, uh, asking for help. So that that's what you want to underline. We have confirmed bugs. So it's not every bug, it's not every report, it's just the one that were confirmed as uh, as bug. And it's not, not important that you have so many of them. It's important that you know this is quality data that you can rely on as a maintainer because your life is uh, already uh, complex enough with this. And then we have patches that is a valuable email sent to the mailing list with patches that we need to deal with, that we need to review, to discuss. And when you click on this, then you arrive on the uh, the public web-based uh, uh, mailing list archive. And you can see whether people are discussing it uh, uh, or not, and you can also see the patch. So Roof is based on this design principle. We need to have, so it's, uh, a tool that you plug on a mailing list and that oversees what's important to track on this mailing list. Triage happens upstream on the list. It doesn't need to happen on the bug tracker tool itself. The bug tracker roof is just a place to advertise important stuff on the mailing list. You don't do triage uh, with wolf. Triage happens upstream. It's made for maintainers, uh, not for complainers. Um, I, actually, the most important thing is that we don't take feature requests on Woof. We only take uh, patches, contributions, help requests, and so on and so on. Feature requests can happen on a mailing list. It doesn't have to happen on, on a bug tracker, and a bug tracker is for bugs, it's not for feature requests. Is action-oriented versus status-oriented? Because when you have this bug tracker and the bug triage problem, you start thinking, okay, what are the categories of the bug? Some are important, not important. And then we'll have a priority system and then have something different. And then you, you, you're lost in the chaos of categorization uh, and finding the proper status and rearranging the status. So you don't have to just do bug create. You also have to do categorization uh, tidying up and, and, and that that's too complex. And we want to solve with Woof and the principle, uh, the design principle is here to solve the problem of organizing your life as a maintainer, organizing your tasks. So when I go here, um, I can skip this section upcoming changes because um, that that's for users. I can see in the help requests, what are the most important ones? Uh, because here it says that there are 1991 um, emails in this discussion. So probably uh, it's quite important. I can see confirm bugs. This is the thing I want to read on the mailing list first. Like I don't want just to 
read a report about hey something broke i want to read uh the report and and get directly to the discussion when i can follow the discussion completely and see where it is so probably um and that here it's the status of this bug someone is asking can you check can you double check so it's pending and i don't have anything to do and uh here again in the patches is the other thing i want to check i want to see uh, what i can commit very easily what requires uh, more thinking and so on and so on so it solved the problem of organizing tasks as a maintainer and solved the problem of moni monitoring changes for users so uh, when you go on wolf uh for users you just want to see this upcoming changes and perhaps if you have some spare time you want to help other people if you see for example hey meme registration well i work for ietf and perhaps i can help dot uh, org files to get registered as a meme format official and then you simply go there and reply to this email so most bug bug trackers are databases on top of emails uh, we think that emails are the database and that we just need to have to monitor this database more uh, in a more clever way i don't say that wolf uh, is um, uh, uh, the magic solution for uh, the problem of bug tracking tools sucking i don't say that these bug trackers suck for everyone perhaps everyone is happy with the uh, um, uh, github issues but i still think that for most free software it's uh, it's still an open issue and that's it for me and uh, i'm open to any question thank you very much Okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, I will read them. And um, um, so have you ever had to deprecate features in org mode? Um, no big features were deprecated. Uh, perhaps some sm very small features were deprecated, but the short answer is no. Uh, one feature that I think could be not deprecated, but very deeply changed would be the logging features. Um, logging happened on the, on the buffer. I didn't show the clocking facility, but you can uh, keep track of the time spent on some tasks. Um, but logging would require would require such work that in a way that maybe it's the current logging feature will be deprecated. Apart from the changes you have already mentioned, what other improvements could be made in the development process? A very good question. Um, we uh, have this page uh, to explain how to contribute. And I think we can improve this page again. So improving this page would improve the way uh, people can uh, contribute. We can have, and we should also, one part that is a bit lacking in your documentation is uh, we have a nice description of the syntax of org mode. So that's something that uh, contributors need to uh, read and know by heart. We had explanations on how to write exporters. Uh, and all this documentation is very nice, but we could have developer oriented focus on some part of the code, explaining, diving deep inside the source code and explaining, hey, this works like that. The second idea would be to have uh, guidelines, very simple uh, tutorials to explain how to write a proper patch. Because we are very well aware that 
um, uh, sending patches through a mailing list is not always uh, easy. So we can have tutorials for this, like to encourage more people just to write patches because uh, because of the success of GitHub. Uh, people know about PRs and pull requests, but they don't know that much about patches. Only, you know, old people like me. Uh, and also guidelines about the GNU coding standard. Uh, when you send a patch through the mailing list, you're happy enough to know about mailing list and know how, but, uh, uh, you know, git send email. But you still have to write a proper commit message, and that's something where a tutorial wouldn't wouldn't hurt. Um, I would like to ask about how you onboard maintainers quickly, given that onboarding maintainers is a big investment, and some sometimes people have to drop off suddenly for whatever reason. Um, one key aspect of this is that. Potential maintainers are uh, always uh, current contributors. So by being current contributors, regular contributors, you have been, you solve the problem of copyright assignment to the Free Software Foundation, for example. So this is not something you don't have to do to embark new maintainers. And what we do is that we split, we try to architect the software in a way that every file has a very limited scope and very precise scope and we embark we embark new maintainers on those files so if you grep for a maintainer on 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 or code base you will find many maintainers because they are maintainers of this file and this feature so having small uh, uh, areas of the code feature wise uh, is the best way to make things predictable for maintainers. Maintainers have life and they want to have things predictable. We can uh, enhance many things in this area. For example, we can, uh, we could develop WOOF, like the, 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 the monitoring tool, the email monitoring tool in a way that makes it easier for maintainers to receive emails uh, when the report is about something they maintain uh, so that they don't have to read the main list constantly uh, but they will still have an email when uh, the bug report is about uh, something they maintain uh, and that would be my answer to Joshua does it answer your question well? Because we can think of other ideas. <laughs> I actually gave a talk about how to become a maintainer, um, but that would be my shorter, my short answer is that split your project in small files and encourage everyone to uh, take ownership on this on this file. Well, um, my main motivation uh, right now uh, is I've been a bad maintainer for the last year, uh, maybe the last two years, because um, my personal life was uh, not stable enough to be a good maintainer. So my motivation right now is to work in a way that I, uh, that I prepare the ground for when I'm not a maintainer anymore. So I don't want to leave the project now and step down because um, uh, I want to leave the project in very good shape. And my motivation is to have uh, people like uh, Nicolas, uh, uh, even Carsten is still contributing, like uh, IHO uh, that I see in, 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 in the participants. Uh, I hope Rachenko, I hope I, I pronounce your, your name well. Those are the ones who maintain uh, Augment right now. 
uh, will keep um, answering emails and you know maintain the the project afloat. Uh, so my motivation as a maintainer is to get more maintainers like that. And if I fail at this, and uh, I shall uh, stop being one. And other than that, my motivation 15 years ago is not really different from the one I had I have now is that you learn so many things about, you know, coding, and about yourself, by being a maintainer, it's different position. So even if you have a small project of yours, take the position of being a maintainer, a real one, like, uh, what is your promise to the users? How do you take seriously the fact that you want more users, if you want more? And all this is uh, really, really interesting. I mean, that's an international effort to share beautiful stuff, beautiful software, useful for everyone. And that's, that's, that's the key part of the motivation. Another answer is, well, um, don't let your tools be a burden. And that's one of the reasons why I don't want to switch to uh, the wrong bug tracker, because I, I still hope we can uh, have a good value proposition for an email monitoring tool, not, not a database on top of emails. Um, yep, yep, yep. It's really rewarding in general. Just, just take the step ahead and you'll see. <laughs> it's, it's really good to feel responsible for building something that you can give to the world afterwards. Um, what's what the process to get a new feature merged into org mode? Is there a RFC process like in the Rust community? No, and um, and uh, all discussions happen on the main list, basically. Uh, this is something I've been thinking about woof, like, should we have a section dedicated to feature requests and discussions about feature requests? I'm, I'm resisting the, tem the temptation to add this because um, I'm not sure it's useful per se, but something that is high on the to-do list for woof is to handle uh, polls uh, more uh, nicely. Uh, polls on mailing list are just uh, informal. You, uh, someone is asking a question and then other people reply with plus one, uh, minus one, but it's hard to count, it's hard to follow, and it's hard to know when the poll ends and so on and so on. So I think Wolf and email tracking could make this very easy. You would start a poll by calling your by adding poll in the subject line of your email, and then Wolf could track of plus one and minus one, and then that would be something informal that could be used as a as a, a request for comments or request for would this be useful to you and so on and so on. Um, but that's not yet uh, there and. Um, uh, this is something I, I just want to to develop, but no, we don't have any RFC process, and and and. Um, but the stakes are different. Like the Rust community, he's a uh, he's a huge one, and and with uh, a, a different structure, and all, all this is very much uh, more informal in 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 org mode. How do you decide the path forward for the world project serving a diverse user base, having uh, varying, often contradicting opinion? Um, I have to think about this. Uh, I have to read it again. Uh, don't hesitate to add uh, to your question, I hope, because I'm not sure I get how do you decide the path forward for the world project, serving a diverse user base, having varying, often contradicting opinions. Yeah, okay. So that is, uh, I said we don't have a roadmap uh, and I don't pretend this is a feature uh, and perhaps this is a problem. 
Uh, and for major changes, a roadmap is certainly useful. So for the ones you want to prioritize and for the one you want to uh, tackle, basically. I don't decide. Uh, um, I What happens is that the one ready to do the work uh, decide by doing the work. Um, and I'm not saying this is the best option ever. It's I'd say I'm saying this is the uh, the rule in a best effort um, community, in a community working on a best effort basis. Um, but that does that the regulation and the trade off happens because uh, people are free to express themselves. Uh, on on the mailing list, I'm not saying that it's that this is all the users, and I know a mailing list can be a barrier. Uh, even public expression can be a barrier. So you don't, of course, we don't know the whole user base, but um, this poll feature on Wolf could be uh, the basis for using uh, the mailing list as a poll system more often. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> Do you have advice on getting more of education or public orgs onto open source software? Big Techs has become aggressive on getting all on their cloud services, or is it the question too off topic now? Um, it's yes, it's a bit off topic, but I'm glad to answer and with what I think. I'm working. Uh, at the free software unit for the French administration right now. And I can see how important it is to have end users uh, asking for free software to their administrations. So I would recommend that every student that think um, universities and academy should use free software, just express yourself. And not to be provocative, provocative, but now that I work in a ministry, I every day I just wonder why is there no free software activist just at the door, <laughs> knocking at our doors and say, hey, we need free software. So express yourself, not just on Mastodon, not just on Twitter, not just by sending a, an email to your MP, or just, but gather, have you know, students' unions go to your ministries and say, we won't leave the door until you have a clear promise about the use of free software, because that's the user, that that's our freedom as citizens, as students, as users. And even if you're not convinced, just means that uh, you've missed the last 40 years of software development and that you are just uh, you know, too easy to work with by the, the big tech companies. So big tech just adapt to what they are required to, to do, what the market requires, what the, the, the ministries require. So ask your ministry and your administration to put more free software and refuse to um, use the proprietary tools when you can. I know sometimes uh, you can't, but when you can, you just have to refuse them. And there is a lot of expertise about these, you know, strikes. I wish what I would call for is a, a national, uh, you know, national strikes of free software developers uh, everywhere in the world for one day. If all free software and open source maintainers were on strike just one day in a year, then everyone would think, oh, who, what do they want? What, what is their point? We have, we've heard about open source, but we thought it was something that the invisible hand of the, you know, the liberal uh, market was dealing correctly. And no, I, I wish there would be an international strike of uh, free software maintainers next year, let's say.
that's probably some something that I will not leave in the video, or maybe I will. Yeah, um, what has changed uh, since this um, um, blog post about uh, getting more help are uh, many things, actually. First of all, we have more co-maintainers like iHaul. I think we can all, always do better, but we have more co-maintainers. Since then, we also have Woof, and uh, again, I'm not saying it's perfect because it's, first of all, it's a personal experiment and the, the, the code base is just me and it's not a very strong free software project. It's just an idea about these design principles that I've been outlining. Uh, second, I organized uh, the thing in so that releasing Ogmod is really easier. Uh, before that blog post, uh, there used to was there used to be an org mode server and releasing was uh, involved, you know, going to the server, do the package stuff on the server, and then publishing them. And it, it was really too complex. Right now, you just put a tag on on the commit, and then you have a new release, and that's that makes really things easier for maintainers. Um, and since uh, the last two years, we have many more maintainers for individual files. Uh, we called for help for individual files, uh, especially bubble files, like uh, the things, uh, the thing I've, I've been demonstrating about literate programming and code execution within the buffer. Every language uh, uh, has its own file and we have uh, maintainers for all these files. So more maintainers, uh, easier tracking of what emerges from the mailing list and uh, a very uh, nicer setup for releasing. That that's what I would say. Of course, we can uh, <laughs> we can do a lot a lot better. One thing that will be better is that when I gonna be when I gonna step down. Uh, I mean, I hope my, me stepping down will be um, uh, 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 you know a new a new start for the next org ten and and plus ten. Uh, generation. And I got much more support, individual support of, uh, you know, people sending me some donations that that also matters. I wish donations would be um, more transparent and more fairly distributed to to the to the org mode contributors. That's something we need to work on. For example, um, the when you list Emacs packages, you have information about the version, about uh, uh, the, the website where you can find um, uh, the the place where the, the the this Emacs library is developed. We should have information about donations here. And we should be able, as a community, as the Emacs community, um, to promote the fact that some of the co-contributors are asking for donations. We, uh, Jonas Bernoulli, Jonas Bernoulli, has been running um, a, a crowdfunding a few years ago, but he still needs donations. So I try myself to advertise uh, the donations I'm making. Um, I just mentioned this. Um, yeah, on this on this software uh, page at the bottom of this page, I advertise the donation the people I support. But I would I would like to support more people, and I would like more people to be supported. But we should organize this uh, within Emacs. This is the platform. Is it okay? Can we, shall we stop now or are there any other questions?
Well, you're welcome, Ian. Um, and you should also thank Augmod contributors that are here in the audience. Don't hesitate to just uh, use this uh, email address, like the main list, just to say thanks. I mean, this is something that that also keeps people running and keeps people thinking, hey, this is this is useful. My work is useful. So thanks for the virtual claps. I feel a bit alone in front of my screen, but that that's the game, right? And the road toward being more inclusive, inclusive um, with uh, women, with minorities, with uh, everyone is a long road ahead, but we need to collectively go there. Not just for the sake of being inclusive, but for the sake of uh, uh, continue to have a diverse uh, community that provides uh, rich feedback and continue to uh, drive more uh, developers to uh, contribute to 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 augment yeah great yeah. i'm glad to hear this yes, yes. hi oh i guess i can talk if my connection is good enough. your connection is good i can hear diversity if you uh, you said that you you said that you're working in a free software government organization. So I'm actually wondering if there's any information about the diversity in free software contributors, like minorities, like gender, and everything. Like, is it even known? So usually we don't really care about like, who is contributing, but uh, the practical structure the contributions is not very well known. I'm not entirely sure I, I got your question right, but I will try to answer. You will you will correct me uh, along the way. One of the nice thing uh, about free software project from the administration is that these projects have constraints on uh, gender equality. So you find uh, a more diverse community within the free software project that are developed by the French administration. I don't have figures. We want to have figures about this because that's also a way to attract uh, developers to work for the uh, French government and administration saying, hey, you want to, you like to share your software, your code source, your source code. You want to join free software efforts. Uh, perhaps it's difficult when you're just alone or when you're in a company because uh, the company doesn't have any uh, rules about having a diverse community or a diverse um, uh, um, employees from a, a diverse background. But we, we have more rules here in, in the administration. I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least it's there. And, um, uh, and that, that, that would be a good reason to join the administration for me. Was it your okay, question? So, uh, I was more asking about the actual uh, free software community. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I think it's a hard problem. One thing that we tried, for example, uh, that was before the COVID crisis, but we started uh, French in, in Paris, we started uh, in real life meetings around Emacs with the hope that such yeah. meetings would be more inclusive because it's easier to talk to people and to be nice with each other uh, by meeting in real life rather than, you know, sending emails, impersonal emails to a mailing list. So we started this, but so far it's really hard. We had a few girls in these meetings. We are like 10 people gathering every two months. And it's really nice and uh, easy going. And we had a few girls, but because they were coming one by one to these meetings, then 
they didn't stay, I, I think. Or maybe because we were just boring guys. But we tried this and it didn't work. Uh, but of course, this cannot be the solution for every online free software project. We need to have more different rules. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Perhaps yeah. one way uh, would be to have um, um, meetings just for girls. I think uh, some people don't misread this kind of initiatives, thinking, oh, this is about excluding uh, males. It's not about ex excluding males. I think it's about allowing uh, more uh, women to feel safe when discussing some topics that they want to discuss with uh, others. And it's a step towards more diversity in general. And so uh, I would love to see, you know, we have uh, girls' movements for Python, for uh, Ruby, uh, Ruby Girls, I think it's called. Uh, and I would love to see this for Emacs. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. I'm stopping the recording right now. Thanks again for the invitation and for the nice uh, questions and, and, and discussion. And uh, see you around on the internet. My email address is this one, if you, anyone wants to get in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, Bastian, for taking time off to give this talk. It has really been an eye-opening talk and then it gave everyone a lot of insights into free software and also the challenges involved. Once again, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.